Hello everyone. Uh, I'd like to first thank Paul for inviting me to come and talk. Um, so I'm the catchment science coordinator from the Ribble Rivers Trust and I'm going to talk to you about uh, river restoration work that we're doing particularly in urban context and I've given it the subheading of the you won't find any fish in there story because when we're working in urban rivers, that's the most common thing anyone says to me when we're fishing for fishing. And then when you turn around and show them a trout this size, generally they're quite shocked. And it's probably my favourite thing about working in urban rivers. So just a bit of structure. So I'm going to talk about the Ribble Rivers Trust, the, uh, Ribble, the Ribble Catchment, uh, how we approach river restoration at the Trust, and then talk about how we have recently started work on the River Douglas catchment, having been invited to join that catchment partnership, and how as a completely new catchment to us, we've approached the work there within just the past year. So, this may look a bit small actually. So for those of you who don't know uh, the Ribble catchment, it uh, starts up in Yorkshire, so you've got uh, all of these lovely places, so you've got Lytham down at the bottom where we discharge into the Ribble Estuary, we've got the River Hodder, which is a lovely spot, Ribble Head Viaduct at the top, uh, Settle, uh, Stainforth Foss where you get to see Salmon Jump near Settle on the Ribble, you've got the Long Preston Deeps Triple SI, uh, again on the Ribble, then we come into the Calder where that comes in more of an urban side to the south part of the catchment. And then the River Darwin comes in, which is even more urbanised with giant weirs on it. And then we've got the Douglas catchment here at the bottom where we're starting work. And that's predominantly the River Douglas and the River Yarrow, which come in there running from the uh, West Pennine Moors Triple SI that's recently got designation there. So we've got plenty of wildlife. The Ribble itself is a principal salmon river. Um, white clawed crayfish are about, along with uh, signal crayfish everywhere, lots of other wildlife, which is nice to have. But we do have our fair share of problems. So we have a lot of weirs. Uh, that's both up through the Yorkshire Dales. We've got lots of field boundary weirs to some larger ones, which we'll put in place for mills. We've got a, quite an industrial heritage on the Ribble itself. Uh, Burnley decided that it wanted to make sure that its water would pass through as quickly as possible, so turned it into a big open sewer, uh, which we've done some work on. And coming through, so we've got moorland grips, agriculture, extensive ag agriculture, intensive agriculture, uh, most types of agriculture, in fact, as well as lots of uh, urban sewage coming in from sewage treatment works and lots of uh, sewage problems within rural areas a lot of agricultural problems as well with over application of nutrients and slurry and the sort. So we've got a bit of everything on the catchment. Um, so our approach to river restoration generally takes along these four pillars of catchment management. So that's managing water quality, water quantity, habitat quality and habitat quantity. So that's how much of things there are. Now, if you want to see what a catchment manager's mind looks like it's something like that which <laughs> is, is quite uh, busy so you've got uh, the four main themes running through of the water quality quantity habitat quant quantity and quality and then all of the different problems that you've got within it and then on the outside all of the solutions that you might have so you have to zoom in quite a lot before you get down to detail within those but that's kind of here are all the problems that we might have. Here's all the solutions that we might have. Uh, so once you've got that, we then move on to how we actually try and deliver ben uh, improvements to the river catchment. So we use best practice based on robust science, such as the Trout in the Town Urban River Toolkit, which we're all keen to hear about and read. Certainly when you're starting off, quick and easy wins are fantastic. So small weirs, something where you can go in just using uh, volunteer labour, it's brilliant. Just go in, take the middle of it out. There you go, huge improvements just based on a small period of time. So we're doing quite a bit of monitoring on some of these currently so that we can demonstrate to landowners, anglers, farmers, everyone that taking out small structures like this is of great benefit. Um, 
And then you can go the other route, which is high impact. This is great for getting attention from people. So this is Paddy and Weir, which was removed, I think, 2010, 2011. So before I got onto the catchment, but that one's opened up a swathe of the River Calder. And then you've also got a giant, one of the biggest sewage uh, CSOs that I've seen. I think it's one of the biggest ones on our catchment coming in just downstream. So you've got more problems alongside those barriers, but that's the way to go. And then multiple benefits. So a lot of this work does have multiple benefits. So try and get the most out of single interventions that you can do, such as tree planting and livestock fencing is brilliant within urban areas. Um, this is Burnley, uh, as I was saying before. So the river was River Calder, which is probably about eight metres wide upstream at this point. It's put into a two metre wide log flume, which goes through the centre of the town. That is uh, just over knee deep at that point, And the water runs through there at about two, two and a half metres per second. So it's quite fun to do electric fishing standing up in that when the bottom is uh, very slippy with algae as well. So uh, health and safety all around. Uh, so that was what it looked like before. We did some work as part of the urban river enhancement scheme in Burnley a number of years ago to improve uh, fish migration through the centre of Burnley. So with the channel being this narrow all the way through with fast water running through, fish are struggling to move up through that continuously. They need places to rest. So what we did was put in a number of resting pools uh, placed uh, strategically through the town. Um, it's quite expensive work this was because it was having to put stuff into resets. We couldn't do any habitat improvement because of flood risk and, and things like that. But uh, this saw salmon move above Burnley for the first time in 200 odd years. So that was nice worthwhile work. Um, these are the fish passes downstream on the rivers Brun and Calder that we've put in place. Nice twin fish pass, which again draws attention and gives a lot of ownership to uh, the rivers Calder and Burnley from the people uh, with there, which is brilliant. So that's kind of the hard hitting stuff as how we try and go about stuff. Um, but we've got the other side of it. So looking at catchment wide strategy. So you've got a large catchment. Where, where do you start? So data gathering is quite important for a lot of the stuff that we do. So generally we're not having to collect our own data for this. It's uh, open source data or it's on the catchment based approach data package, which we're able to collate and then process using GIS to turn it into prioritization layers. So it, that's taken issues like uh, sediment erosion within areas using the SIMAP models and combining that with uh, FIO models and things like that and putting that together to come up with where you should be planting woodlands in your catchment based on all that information which takes into account slope and other factors like that. What's so, FIO model like? Oh, sorry, I should. So there's uh, a model recently come out from Durham which uh, models the faecal indicator organisms, so that's centrococci and uh, e. coli, so where you're most likely to be getting inputs from that based on where farming occurs and where you've got slope and various other uh, factors. So taking all of that information, combining it together to give you uh, individual prioritised areas where you've got certain colours showing you hot spots on the map where you've got problems and then overlaying it with what else you've been doing on the catchment. So this uh, is overlaid with farm advice areas. So we do a lot of farm advice on, to, on the catchment, overlaying those two together to give us where we know there's opportunities and identifying where exactly we should be doing work. So that allows us to prioritize where then we should be going and looking if we can. Uh, our director's done this and he did it for the whole catchment. He says, if you give him 55 million, he might be able to make a good start. Uh, putting the cost on everything so it does bring up a lot of uh, opportunities and we are talking kind of long time um, plans so we've got our strategy but do you want to miss opportunities no you don't so what do you do we, opportunism so that's doing because we can do it the options become available uh, strategic doing it because we think it's best so that's the stuff based on what the data's telling us where we should do it um, 
having to look at these in terms of uh, your context and aspiration in terms of your long-term plans. So can you take one individual barrier in one location, do a fish pass project there, and then that will then add to the value of taking out something downstream perhaps, because no one will give you the million pounds it will cost to do this barrier here, because there's a number of smaller ones upstream that are making it so that's not very good value for money. But if you take out these small ones, suddenly the million pounds is much better value for money because you've got 20 kilometers plus upstream, which has become available in terms of habitat. So we try to balance between the two. So we use a strategic opportunism approach. So we're not gonna give up opportunities just because they don't fit within our strategy, but we like to take the broader approach to things. So I'm gonna talk about the Douglas catchment. So last year, uh, Groundwork and the Douglas Partnership invited us to join the partnership to use our experience as what we've done on the Ribble to help improve the fisheries on the Douglas. So this catchment, I live on the catchment, but I work on the Ribble catchment. And uh, I personally didn't know a lot about the catchment because I've only recently moved up to the area. So this is a great opportunity for me living on the catchment to actually get to know my river and try and improve the local area. So I was quite excited about that. So this catchment runs off the West Pennine Moors to the east of this map uh, through some uh, reservoirs and then down through urban areas. So you've got Wigan, Skelmersdale, Chorley and Leyland. You've got the River Yarrow and the River Lostock, which are some of the main tributaries to the north. The Catchment is slightly less of an upland catchment than the Ribble, so there is an element within the upper areas, certainly upstream of Wigan, where it becomes a bit more of an upland catchment with the gradient, and then it starts to move into more of a mixed fishery further down. The River Yarrow historically has had quite a bit of work done on it by the Friends of the River Yarrow and the Environment Agency uh, to improve fish passage through there. I've heard of salmon. Uh, moving up through there and certainly sea trout. Uh, there are no records of salmon spawning on that river yet, but hopefully we do find some and we can continue to improve the catchment throughout. So where do we start? So we had the catchment partnership, which is a great basis for us to start because it's a group of organisations who've been doing work on the catchment, each separately to try and improve it. Uh, so we've got uh, councils, uh, landowners, volunteers, Wild Trout Trust. Um, there's, there's quite a long list, but I'm not going to remember them all. But uh, United Utilities Environment Agency, uh, lots of people who already have existing data and knowledge, a lot of local knowledge, which they can pass on to us. I suppose one of the challenges of approaching a new catchment is trying to get all the knowledge that everyone else has and try and put it in your head quickly so that you can make decisions based on what they know. Now, a lot of that's not always down on paper, which is one of the problems, uh, or one of the challenges, should I say, in doing it. But over quite a short period of time, I think we've managed to get a good uh, hold on the catchment and its issues and are moving forward within that. So where do we start? So we had the fisheries group was set up uh, at the back end of 2018. One of the things which we wanted to do was uh, say, okay, data gathering. Let's try and find out something about the catchment. So quickly for us, one of the big things that's uh, very easy to get quick wins on is uh, migration barriers. Doing work on migration barriers opens up large segments of river can have lead to large improvements in the river for quite a small amount of investment relatively to trying to do work on farm advice and working to reduce other pollutions. So we gathered barrier data from uh, the River Obstacles app. That's nice free data. Uh, there's also the Amber app and the Environment Agency as well. Got a lot of data. So that's data that's all been collected either by the agency or through various programs and also volunteers via the uh, River Obstacles app. So all of that work that had been done previously then led to great well it gave us a great base to work to start from to move forward uh, then we had the environment agency fisheries data which was quite nice to have uh, it's an interesting data set because it's 27 years worth of data uh, 
but on the whole, a lot of the sites weren't fished year on year. So it's just, it's sporadic sites here, there and everywhere. So, you know, at one point in time, there was an eel found in the upper catchment, but then later on, it's not been surveyed for 24 years. So you don't know how much things have changed on that catchment, particularly when the, we when the Douglas itself has been subject to a lot of pollution incidents through that time. So fisheries have been decimated maybe might be the right word uh, during that time and are still struggling to recover so we can take these two data sets and overlay them so here we've got green dots with, that's where all the trout have been found on the catchment it's not saying that's the only place this trout exists but that's the only place where trout have been found through electric fishing surveys so it's predominantly the upper Douglas catchment here the river Yarrow up through the Lost Stock and then some through uh, the Tord as well, up through Skelmersdale. So there's a lot of black dots on that map without any trout present, which isn't fantastic. And that's particularly the case all the way around Wigan. And now a lot of that habitat is very suitable for trout. So reasons why trout haven't been found there are likely due to pollution incidents uh, through the time. But you can also start looking at the migration barriers, which are there and overlaying these two data sets and seeing, okay, so we've only got trout within this area. If there's a pollution incident all through this area, it's killed all the trout. And there's a big migration barrier here. How are the trout ever gonna manage to get back to where they were before they all died off through the pollution incident? And you start putting pieces of the puzzle together to prioritize where you want to start working and where you can possibly have the greatest benefit and uh, so fisheries group set up we've got our barrier and fisheries data at the same time there was some funding became available for us to do a story map for the douglas catchment so that's gathering a lot of information from the catchment based approach data package putting that all together information on the catchment and this is adding to our knowledge base for where we can actually start working from putting that with the barrier data set the fisheries data and allowing us to streamline our approach to where we want to get to which is right where where should we be working and uh, where should we uh, when sh how quickly can we start on that so for those of you who haven't seen one of the uh, cabba story maps yet so this is funded through a uh, natural course um, it's a Great interactive data portal, effectively, with uh, interactive maps on it where you can display all your catchments data, which is freely available. So uh, you've got your general blurbs where you've got all the information. You've then got all your catchment characteristics, so where you've got triple SIs, local nature reserves, and things like that. You've got the uh, status of your rivers as categorized by the Environment Agency recently. So. All of that yellow means that the Douglas is moderate and failing for WFD. Uh, it's an interesting one because fisheries aren't actually classified on most of these rivers because most of them are considered to be uh, heavily modified water bodies. So a lot of the rivers don't have a fisheries assessment on them. Uh, we're trying to get it to the point where they will start to do fisheries assessments on them and use it to classify. Uh, so that's our aim anyway. Uh, and we've included within this uh, a fisheries strategy tab. So this is somewhere where you can take all that data where you've got uh, all of your fisheries and barrier data and look at species richness and overlay all that information and do it online. Any of the partners, any, anyone can get access to this. It's freely available online. So someone who just wants to know about the river catchment can come and quickly go through, well, quickly, relatively quickly, go through all this data and actually know quite a lot about the Ribble catchment, its fisheries, its issues, historic pollution incidents, because those uh, uh, are actually plotted on there as well. And you can get a good idea of the status of the catchment. So we managed to do that fairly recently, and that was very good. So, we had that going on, so we're still making our plans, but we haven't got any teeth or funding to do anything yet. Uh, and then 
it just so happened that recently in the Upper Douglas, United Utilities has had a failing on one of their infrastructures that led to a number of fish dying up near Rivington Reservoir, which led to £500,000, which has then come to the River Douglas Partnership for us to do work on improving fish passage within the Upper Douglas. Now, you could say that's lucky. Well, not so lucky for the river, but in terms of a funding opportunity to make an impact, it's been very good for us to be able to use that money moving forward. So that's given us a chance to do something. So we've got the Upper Douglas Fish Passage Project now suddenly appearing. Where should we start? I don't know. We've got all this information. What will give most benefit? So we on the Ribble have come up with a barrier prioritisation model, looking at all of the barriers on the Ribble and looking through the uh, characteristics where those barriers are placed and come up with a prioritisation of which order you should do them in an ideal world. So we did some data analysis and decided to take this model and apply it on the Douglas. So aim of it, it, it's, it is a relatively simple GIS analysis to prioritise which barriers open up the greatest amount of watercourse upstream of them. So if you take it out, how much river are you opening up upstream? So to do that, you need to take the, you need to build a river network effectively, which involves going through all the river networks that currently exist. So a detailed river network, which is an environment agency data set, the Ordnance Survey master map data set, pulling those together so you've got uh, you can use that to apply length and also area of watercourse. So that's hectareage, which a bunch of funders prefer that, certainly European ones for um, your outputs. So we go through there, you remove certain connections where the rivers join in, etc. So it can be a bit of a tedious effort going through the entire river network, uh, dejoining it where it isn't actually joined. Uh, and then going through your barrier data. So a lot of the barrier data, which, because you've got multiple sources, it can be duplicated or it, it might be wrong, but eventually you go through all of that and get to somewhere where you think, okay, this is as best as we know the barriers are within the catchment. But of course, there might still be errors in there, but without walking every single inch of the catchment, you can't know that. And that's quite a time consuming and expensive uh, option. So that's then run through a tool which calculates the area of watercourse and uh, amount of the length of the watercourse upstream. And then your barriers are, ba are ranked based on the length available upstream and then the area of open water available upstream. And it gives you information on the area which is culverted upstream. So if you've got a lot of culverts upstream, it might take away the value of uh, doing something there. So outputs again, we've used ArcGIS online to uh, have a nice interactive tool. We're going to take this and then plug it into the story map eventually. So this gives you your map with all your data points on it, which are all ranked. And so you've got all your barriers, all your metadata that you've added into it, your lengths and your areas, which are done. And from this list, you can start to go, Okay, you can go in, you can interact, you can click on all the points, see what the barriers look like, etc. if you link all the pictures to it. So it's, it's a nice tool and you can start thinking. So now we know how much area or length is opened up by each of these barriers. But there are other things to take into account before we start thinking about prioritisation. There's feasibility, likelihood of being able to do things there. Uh, are some of these actually migration barriers? Are they minimally migration barriers? Uh, some of them are giant 10 foot high weirs, some of them are this small. So you've got to take that into account as you're looking forward. So when we do a fish passage appraisal, just looking at each site, these are all the list of things that we take into account. So what species are present uh, or what your target species is, because sometimes you might just be looking to improve fish passage for game species. Generally, the preferred option is to improve for all species because uh, everything needs to migrate, even though you'll have arguments with some people who will tell you otherwise. Even bullheads migrate, that's interesting. Um, 
Is there anything known about fish migration at the site? Do they go up one side of the river in particular? So can, if you're looking at putting a fish pass in place, that then can give you an idea, oh, I should be putting my fish pass up there. Um, how big's the area of catchment that you're going to be opening up? Uh, where is that barrier within the catchment itself? Because if you're trying to uh, improve a barrier further up a system, but there are other barriers further down, you might be better either going for the one at the bottom, taking the bottom up approach, or you might be better taking the upstream approach like I talked about earlier to give that added value to a bigger barrier down the catchment. Uh, other invasive species which might be uh, uh, impacted by the work that you're doing. Uh, flooding, construction, construction constraints is a big one. Can you actually get there with the machinery you need? Can you get into river? Um, health and safety, so that's like the construction design management approach to things. Uh, other stakeholders, there's a lot of people involved who, um, a lot of people like weirs. A lot of people like to see fish jumping and slapping themselves off weirs, which always amuses me. Um, archaeological surveys, you're probably going to need to do those on a lot of old mill buildings, which often involves a photographic survey to categorise them. Uh, what's the adjacent land use? Is it housing? Are there farms involved if you decide to take out this barrier and the, ri the, the riverbed decides to go shooting off upstream and the river levels are dropping? Are you going to be causing collapse of riverbanks? So, uh, and then, well, you get down to the bottom of it, it's budget. <laughs> How much money do you actually have to do anything? Because if you haven't got the money to do it, then you might be better off coming back another day or doing a feasibility study and setting a plan in place. Hey, yep. Yes, but without a formal assessment generally, because we, we don't have yes, a lot of formal assessments yeah, for it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it would be. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's mostly more of a local knowledge type thing. So you've got all this to take into account when you're looking at prioritising your barriers further. So we did this on the Douglas, and because the river, uh, the funding was specifically for the <coughs> upper Douglas, we called the cut off the canal siphon through uh, Wigan, where it goes underneath the uh, Leeds Liverpool Canal. So, upstream of there, there are a number of barriers on the river as it uh, flows from north to south through there. Uh, and we've got a number of <laughs> different barriers with various ranks. You'll notice that not many of these are actually low-ranked barriers in terms of what they call opening up habitat. Uh, so Skulls Weir was one we looked at. This is, it is acting as quite a migration barrier, so this is in the top right. It's a river sluice, which then acts as a feeder for the canal. Um, the only fish that are getting over there are fish that can leap. And you might the question, but rank one is the, is the best Weird That's the most area and most length that you'd be opening up. There was, I think, 157 barriers that we uh, assessed as part of this. Um, Sorry. So, no, it's fine. Um, so you'd be asking why we're starting at rank 28. Partially because it's a large barrier. And one of the things which you're looking at is multiple areas which are being connected up through this. So... We looked at the river and saw a number of barriers and thought we can make a difference by linking up two focus areas. If we look at just these two focus areas, that's where we want to go to try and improve habitat because we can link up a large area of river by doing key barriers within those two focus areas. So it's of greatest benefit for that area. So you've got Skulls Weir, which definitely is a migration barrier for quite a lot of species, even trout are going to be held up at that, that's about 60 centimetre head on that river sluice, um, which they'll be able, some will be able to jump, but it will be causing delays and various other impacts along there. But then upstream of that, there's a whole selection of barriers through there, which you look at in isolation, they're not really migration barriers, they're small little bed check weirs. Everything that we did here in terms of the work and looking at priorities and where we'd like to do work, we took all of that back to the catchment partnership and put it forward as a proposal saying this is what we think is best. 
and in, in this instance, people, we had a good discussion over it and uh, people were in agreement as to what we'd proposed as to where we are moving forward. So it's a very much a symbiotic partnership with us working with all of the catchment partners, including Paul and Ian and the Environment Agency and everyone else who's involved. So it's, it's been a really good process uh, with everyone inputting. So we got to this point where we've um, recommended number of what structures we should be doing and we know our lengths of river that are fragmented and where we've then prioritised them. Uh, so what we want to ask now is can we actually do anything at these weirs? So we are uh, currently going through the stage at this moment of doing outline feasibility for the weirs. So we're talking to landowners, all the stakeholders, agencies, trying to find out whether it's going to be possible. Because if we approach someone and they just turn around and say, no, you're not doing anything because I don't want you to, then that's kind of the end of the project. But, and it's not worth putting more money in trying to then do uh, proper designs, etc., because they've just said no flat out. We'll come back to it at another time and try and uh, talk to them to improve relationships and convince them that it would be beneficial for us to do something. And so we're going through this stage. And then if we know that every, all of these barriers are then going to be possible as fish passage projects, we're going to move on to the next stage, which will be that appraisal, looking at what option might be best for um, fish passage at the site, coming up with a number of design options and going to both the catchment partnership and uh, the landowners, the structure owners themselves, trying to come up with an option which will be most suitable for them, as well as fish passage at the site. Now, in some circumstances, we may come to uh, a compromise between what is the best fish passage option, which is usually just knock the structure out. I don't think we can take out any of the structures which uh, are in this project. I might be proved wrong upon discussion with uh, people. But they've all got uh, land uses, so whether that's uh, canal feeder weirs and things like that. So they'll, a lot of them have abstractions on them currently. So we're going to move forward with that stage after and then go through the getting all the permissions, any hydraulic flood modelling and things done and then working forward to construction delivery, which would be within uh, 2021 and 2022. As we've got this going on, interested in development, the Environment Agency through uh, the Water Environment Improvement Fund are also funding us to write a fishery strategy for the River Douglas area. Now, you remember I was talking about opportunism and strategy before, and we've kind of done this mix of strategic opportunism but now we're actually getting some money so that we can write a proper strategy which we can then refer to as a document. Funders will enjoy having something which is giving you th them the evidence as to why you are doing what you're doing. Why do you want their money? Here is why we want your money because it's a great benefit to these areas which were shown to be priority uh, areas to invest in. So we're doing that at the same time. So we'll be finishing that by the end of March next year. So that also includes... a. Uh, feasibility study for that giant uh, weir further down the catchment, see if we can actually do a fish pass improvement scheme on that in the future. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, there is still always hope. So you remember that area in Wigan where there were no uh, trout known to exist. Uh, recently went out with two landowners uh, adjacent to the river there and we found a brown trout fry, one single brown trout fry within the area on one of the riffles. So that was fantastic to find and hopefully we can get more there in the future as well as more of everything. Um, thank you.